If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech In fact, if you want to do a case study in how to deliberately keep a country underdeveloped, including democracy building and the government, people should go to Afghanistan. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a true democracy and a just society. I am your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Zahir Wahab. He is a professor emeritus from Lewis and Clark College Graduate School and a visiting professor at Kabul Education University and Kabul University since 2006. He was our guest a couple, for a couple of episodes of Populist Dialogues in 2011. So uh, I want to welcome you back to the program. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. You bet. When you were here last you know, two years ago, yeah. uh, you started, or, or maybe you had already been, uh, traveling back and forth between here and Afghanistan. When you go to Afghanistan, what's your mission there? Uh, well, uh, I have been going to Afghanistan for the last 12 years. Uh, I first went there in early 2002, uh, just uh, two months after the Taliban were ejected from power. And uh, ever since, uh, I have been spending at least a semester in Afghanistan or two semesters sometimes. Uh, for the first five or six years, uh, I was a senior advisor to the Ministry of Higher Education, mm -hmm. trying to reconstruct and rebuild the higher education system. But for the last six years, uh, I have been essentially teaching uh, in uh, a master's degree program for teacher education faculty. Uh, there are 17 teacher training colleges and universities uh, training high school teachers for the entire country. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. And then this last year, uh, I also began teaching in another master's degree program at Kabul University, which trains people in public policy and uh, administration. Uh, faculty development uh, is uh, one area where a lot of work uh, needs to be done, David, because uh, after 4,000 or so university professors, only 5% have doctorate degrees, and another 35% have master's degrees. 60% of the university instructors only have bachelor's degrees mm -hmm. from within their own universities. And this includes people like in medicine, engineering, journalism, pharmacy, you name it. So there is a, um, a very serious um, shortage of qualified uh, faculty who can teach, conduct research, and do community service. So that's what, what I've been doing for the last six years, teaching uh, in these two programs. Uh, the master's degree programs, people spend four semesters uh, and then uh, are granted master's degrees and uh, you know the credentials and so forth. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, when you went over those numbers, I was kind of, I'm kind of surprised because it seems like uh, Afghanistan has been under military occupation for not only American but also Soviet, and that with all that military activity, that the education system in Afghanistan, I would have imagined, uh, over the course of these years, would have been totally destroyed. So I, I'm kind of impressed that there's that much activity there already. Um, well, the answer is kind of uh, complicated. Um, actually, Afghanistan uh, used to have one of the best education, higher education system in the whole region, in South and Central Asia in the 1960s and 70s, where students from other countries came and studied in mm. Afghan universities. And then, as you pointed out, um, the country began, uh, you know, having these problems. So. Um, uh, you know, there has been turmoil and civil war, occupations of one kind or another, sectarian wars for the last 35 years. In fact, the vast majority of the students that I have been dealing with, and these are university instructors or mid-career civil servants and so forth, have not known a normal life. Uh, and so uh, the education system uh, went declined uh, substantially in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, and uh, during the Taliban era, 
uh, things became even worse, where there were only five universities and a few um, schools open altogether. Maybe there were fewer than one million people uh, in the education system. But uh, one of the accomplishments uh, I think uh, we have to acknowledge is uh, the expansion of education from first grade through the university. Uh, and so in terms of numbers now, there are maybe 8 million students going to school K through 12th, but there are another 8 million students who are not in school. Uh, and the 8 million students who do go to school, for example, um, uh, half the schools have no school building. Uh, yeah. And the vast majority of the teachers are not unqualified or underqualified. There are no textbooks. There are no facilities. And maybe only one and a half percent of the university uh, age population uh, are enrolled in public universities and private universities. So um, uh, uh, in terms of quantity, yes, uh, uh, there are more schools and more students, more teachers and more professors. But um, quality has declined considerably because Imagine, for example, the government can only spend $518 per university student per year. Wow. And that's for everything, from chalk to, you know, to electricity to water to professor salaries and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine, you know, here students spend that much on textbooks for a semester. Yeah. And uh, at the K through 12th level, I think the government can only spend maybe $60 per year per child. So. Quantity, yes, but quality um, uh, has declined and it's uh -huh. very, very poor. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, this is a country where 70% of the population are under 25. So the vast majority of the people are actually of school age, uh -huh. and yet uh, very few of them go to school or finish school or when they finish school find work. Uh -huh. So this is the, this is the, the time bomb. I think uh, that could come to haunt both the occupiers and the, the puppet government uh, in the country. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so you you describe it as a puppet government. T talk about that. Why do you describe it that way? Well, uh, uh, um, when the Taliban were ejected, uh, which we can talk about, you know, there was no reason because the Taliban did try to um, uh, avert uh, and prevent. Uh, the occupation and invasion by the United States and some 50 uh, of its allies. Uh, but that's history now. And, yeah. uh, and then the United States, Europe, and the UN convened this meeting in December uh, in Bonn, Germany, uh, and picked these uh, Afghans from the diaspora. Uh, you know, they found these people who lived in different countries, from Virginia, Pakistan, Iran, and uh, Europe, and other places. Uh, and had some kind of uh, uh, voting uh, and decided on this government and put them on a German plane and landed in, in uh -huh. Kabul. So um, most of the people who were in power are in power, in fact. Uh, many of them are considered to be war criminals. Uh, these are people with uh, blood on their hands. Uh, and um, there was one election, well, there had been two elections for the president. The first one wasn't so bad, but the second one uh, was very problematic by international standards. And there was supposed to be the third election. So the puppet government, um, I say so because uh, actually it's a government that was put together, uh, decided upon, and imposed, uh, including the Constitution, imposed on the country. The Afghans have had very little to do with the government. And at this point, for example, there's a tremendous distance between the government apparatus on the one hand and the people on the other. Um, the people don't trust or like or respect uh, the government, and the government doesn't seem to care about the people. The other thing is that this government, in, from the president's salary all the way to a school janitor, uh, has been funded by uh, the occupiers essentially the United States and, and its allies, Germany, Japan, and other countries. Uh, and also, the government really has no autonomy. I mean, it's, it does what the United States Embassy and uh, the commander of the ISAF would tell them to do. It, it and it's perceived it, as such, too. Yeah. It, it, it seems like in the United States, a lot of the news stories, and there aren't very many news stories about Afghanistan anymore. Unfortunately, amazing. Right. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the ones that I have read in the, you know, in the, in the 
corporate uh, media have been about uh, how the Afghan government uh, objects to some of the things that the United States is doing. Um, but you yes. describe them. Well, there's always, uh, there is sort of, uh, sort of an apparent tension between Washington and Kabul, uh, especially in, in the last year or so. Uh, Mr. Karzai has been in power now for, uh, you know, 10 years or so, almost 11 years. Um, and he, in fact, um, is despised by most Afghans. Uh, and he was the compromise candidate because he's a Pashtun and they wanted a Pashtun president, but he's not really a Pashtun and hasn't done much for the Pashtuns and, and so forth. Um, the, the Afghan history points out to another um, man, uh, Shah Shija, uh, who was the sort of worked for the British? He was a king, but a front man for the British when the, Brit, the Brits tried to occupy the country. Uh, so, uh, for the last, you know, essentially the last 10 years, Karzai and his entire apparatus always followed what the, the American embassy and the uh, ISAF, uh, International Security Assistance Force, would tell them. But that, of course, means that uh, you know he has alienated the vast majority of the Afghans, and he's afraid uh, something is, that might be interesting for our viewers is that uh, no, throughout Afghan history, no Afghan ruler has uh, changed place uh, peacefully. Uh, mm -hmm. Afghan rulers have either been assassinated or deposed or exiled uh -huh. or somehow. So, so he might he, be getting a little nervous. Uh, he might be. Uh, he has every reason to be very nervous. Uh, in fact, he never, he hardly ever travels by road. So if he is going, let's say, from here to uh, another part of Portland, he will take one of the big Chinook helicopters. Uh, uh -huh. uh, so, um, so, th so now, uh, in order to uh, sort of establish his credibility, and avoid, uh, you know, the fate of his predecessors. Uh, he is posturing. It's all posturing. It's theater, really. He wants to demonstrate uh -huh. that he can stand up to Washington and mm -hmm. uh, the American government and the American forces. Uh, but also, he's under tremendous pressure. So whether it's, uh, you know, these drones, um, whether it's uh, night raids, whether it's uh, these prisoners in Guantanamo and Bagram, whether it's, for example, uh, uh, the occupiers uh, literally occupying Kabul and turning it into a garrison state. Uh, he's, so people get very angry and people disappear and their bodies turn up. So he's under pressure. But also I think he wants to sort of secure some kind of credibility in the eyes of the Afghan. And so by uh, posturing as if he were standing up to mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the Americans. But in terms of the basics, uh, you know, there is a partnership agreement that is being signed, and he has agreed that the United States will establish nine uh, bases in Afghanistan, yeah. uh, and he has agreed to the continued presence of uh, some U.S. troops, CIA special forces, and some advisors, and so forth. Uh, so I think he's in a difficult position because he knows that without the Americans, he could not even pay for the electricity in the palace. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but he also knows that if he uh, um, does not listen to some of the Afghans, uh, you know, he could be hanged uh, in one of those uh -huh. squares uh, oh, like yeah. his predecessors. Right, okay. Um, has the American government and the occupation forces, have they engaged in any actual reconstruction of the country? Uh, this is one of the biggest failures uh, of this uh, venture. Uh, I don't call it a war, and I see that you don't call it a war either because it's not a war. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, no Afghan government has declared war on anybody. Right, uh, and, and neither, States. unfortunately, has the, has the American government and, declared war. Uh, uh, well, the American We conduct war, but we don't declare it. We de de yeah, we, right. there's no need for Congress. As if, uh, right. In fact, we could dismiss Congress because it hasn't done much, mm -hmm. uh, even on the domestic front. Uh, so... Uh, um, the, the, the issue is that uh, uh, this has been going on, you know, for, for so many years now. Uh, and I forgot the, the point uh, of the, I asked the, about reconstruction. The reconstruction, yes. Um, uh, sim for the last 12 years, the world community has pledged about uh, $80 billion. And it's estimated that $60 billion um, has entered the country. But... Uh, 
two-thirds of the money has gone back. And it's important, I think, one, the development assistance, $60 billion plus dollars, half of it goes to the training of security forces, the Afghan army, the Afghan police, and the Afghan intelligence. The other half goes to, quote, development. But of that money, uh, most of the money is spent either by the donor country, they decide what to do with the money, uh, or it's spent by uh, uh, NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations from the donor countries, let's say the USAID or uh, the Japan International Cooperation Agency or CEDA from Sweden. Um, only maybe 10 to 12 percent of the money that comes in is given to the Afghan government to spend on things that they think should be done. So, um, so now you hear these incredible stories of bases being built uh, all over the country and there's no one to turn the bases over to. Uh, they're de demolishing them. Oh. Uh, and that's why, for example, um, and also they were, the money was spent on consumption. Instead of building productive uh, enterprises like bands, like dams, for example, or farms, or factories, or um, good schools, good universities, for example, money was, most, was mostly spent on consumption, like food, medicine, uh, electricity, fuel, um, uh, uniforms for the Afghan army, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you go to Afghanistan now, um, in fact, you see very little development. Uh, on top of that, there's massive corruption. Uh, last year alone, for example, four and a half billion dollars um, uh, left the country in cash. Oh, and there was a survey done last year, 60% of the Afghans had to give some kind of a bribe to the government. So the development funds uh, either left the country to buy these experts. Uh, there have been um, eight, seven or 8,000 uh, consultants, foreign consultants, and these are very well paid. Mm -hmm. And they have been paid eight billion dollars over the last, say, 10 years. So when money comes, uh, most of the money goes back to the donor sure. country. Uh -huh. uh, some of the money is pocketed by the Afghan government or the contractors and so forth. And very little of the money actually goes to build a school or a road or a bridge or something else. And so people keep asking, where is the development? Mm -hmm. And what about all this money? And there's no answer to it. So, in, in, since most of this money is funding NGOs and not the Afghan government itself, that kind of delegitimizes the government. Which is, uh, and Karzai, in fact, has pointed out, yes, uh, because, and, it's, um, and people can see that, uh, because, say, in the Ministry of Higher Education, the American advisor has much more power than, say, the minister himself. Mm -hmm. And he's perceived as more powerful because he is the one with the money, and he can decide, you know, um, where to spend the money. Um, uh, he can provide uh, computers. He can uh, refurbish a classroom. He can send people on scholarships. Uh, yes, the, the NGOs, in fact, uh, have, are like a parallel government. It has been said that in Afghanistan there are three or four centers of power. First is the ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force which is the NATO and American forces. Second is the American embassy. Uh, and third are the NGOs. Fourth is the Afghan government in mm -hmm. that order. Mm -hmm. In terms of resources, in terms of power, in terms of legitimacy, in terms of people's perception as to who actually has the power. And this has created a big problem. It has weakened the government. So I maintain that, in fact, if you want to do a case study in how to deliberately keep a country underdeveloped, including democracy building and the government, people should go to Afghanistan to see how invasions and occupations and the so-called foreign assistance has deliberately kept this country underdeveloped yeah. and prevented the people from developing uh, their own institutions, their own political system, their own economy, etc. Ninety percent of the Afghan economy now depends on the presence of foreigners. 
only 10% of the revenues are generated, and the whole GDP is about $16 billion. Wow. So yeah. this tells you something. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of what has happened in Haiti. I mean, it sounds like a very, very similar yes, kind of process. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. I remember the, uh, a woman, an American woman, who wrote a book on Haiti. I think it was, Haiti is called the Republic of uh, NGOs. Oh, yeah. Afghanistan is mm -hmm. also the Republic of NGOs. Mm -hmm. And those NGOs are not very altruistic or very honest, be they Afghan or uh, um, foreign. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are literally thousands of NGOs doing all kinds of things. But uh, when you look at the people, so even if now, for example, um, the vast majority of the people are poor. More than half of the people are hungry. More than half the people are unemployed. For example, in terms of sickness, uh, you know, hospital beds, uh, drinking water, electricity, et cetera, et cetera, it ranks toward the very bottom. And these um, Americans in 50 other countries have been there for 12 years and spending all this money. But most of the money also, of course, as you know, uh, the world community has spent about a trillion dollars on the military operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the World Bank, in fact, came up with an estimate that uh, the occupation has cost the country $240 billion. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about drones in Afghanistan. And we've had a couple of programs recently here that yeah. we've talked about drones, at least as they're being being starting to be used in the United States. But talk about how yeah. people feel about drones in Afghanistan. Well, people, uh, uh, last year there were about 500 drone attacks uh, in Afghanistan, uh, a country the size of Texas. And uh, no one knows exactly how many people were killed in Maine because, uh, you know, the press can't go to many parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the press or government people, in fact, sometimes even the ISAF or the Afghan National Security Forces, uh, can't go outside of Kabul because uh, of the insurgents. Oh. So uh, you t people talk about this, you know, these, uh, they call them bzzz because they sound, you know, like that. Uh, they call them buzz. And uh, I know they're there and they work uh, around the clock. And every now and then you hear, you know, uh, a village or a wedding party or a p funeral or people just having a meeting or uh, people who are considered to be um, hostile, you know, these um, insurgents and so forth mm -hmm. are being killed or maimed. Um, people at this point, initially, you know, most Afghans welcomed the Americans and their allies. I think we should point out that uh, uh, at this point there are about 45 countries with troops in Afghanistan, even people that places like Norway or New Zealand mm. or Jordan or the UAE. Countries that have not been attacked by uh, insurgents yeah, uh -huh. or the Afghans, I mean, they have nothing to do, but, but they have troops. So there are, uh, you know, 110,000 troops from some 46 different countries. Initially, people welcomed because people were getting a little tired of the um, uh, heavy-handedness of the Taliban and restrictions and so forth. And so people welcomed uh, these uh, occupation forces, but also the occupiers uh, promised all kinds of things, economic development, democracy, women's liberation, eradication of drugs, stability, peace, law and order, etc. And now, 12 years later, uh, people are not seeing very much of that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, people are being killed all the time, uh, you know. So uh, I think at this point, uh, it's not just the drones uh, or the helicopters which you hear 24 hours fly, uh, flying very low or uh, fighter jets. Um, people simply have had it with foreigners. I think people would really like the foreigners to leave mm -hmm. uh, because they have become a problem and because it's estimated that maybe over the years 120,000 Afghans, civilians, combatants, etc., have been killed. And that's a lot of people a lot for of a people. small country, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, our, our, our time is up. Uh, uh, I, we have about a minute. Do you want yeah. to make a last statement about... Uh, well, I think the statement, I mean, I'm just astonished that uh, the war, this occupation, uh, is almost forgotten in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mainstream press, uh, the politicos, uh, the liberals, the progressives, you know, et cetera, 
uh, I don't hear much about it, and yet, uh, you know, this uh, occupation and invasion uh, has uh, destroyed two countries. You know, it has nearly bankrupted the United States economically and also morally, and it's wrecked uh, a country and a society uh, at the other end, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet there's very little talk and concern, and I keep wondering, where is the moral outrage? You know, and we talk about democracy there, but uh, we seem to, as Chomsky would say, there seems to be a democracy deficit in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is Congress? You know, where is the American press? Where is the American public? You know, what does it mean that we spend one million dollars per year per uh, American soldier in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. And here we close cities and our cities go bankrupt and we close schools. What will it take for the Americans to be morally outraged and bring pressure on the you know, government, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to stop? this and reprioritize and relate to other countries as a nation and not as an empire. You ask very good questions. And well, I thank, thank you. Thank you for being thank you. here. All well, right. Thank you. Right. Good talking to you. Uh -huh. Our guest today has been Zahir Wahab, Professor Emeritus at Lewis and Clark College Graduate School uh, and Visiting Professor at Kabul Education University and Kabul University since 2006. Uh, Alliance for Democracy is teaming up with Community Rights Portland to bring Thomas Lindsay to Portland for two events. Thomas is the founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which has been instrumental in enacting community rights ordinances in rural communities in Pennsylvania to ban specific corporate abuses to those local communities. The largest of these was a recent ban on fracking enacted by the city of Pittsburgh. Thomas is scheduled to be in Portland on September 21st at Portland State University talking about creating a safe and local food system in part by banning the use of GMOs in agriculture. His second event is sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy. It will take place on Sunday, September 22nd at the First Unitarian Church in downtown Portland. His topic then will be why not local democracy. Get more details on both events at the local, at the Portland Alliance for Democracy website at afd-pdx.org, and you can learn more about the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund at www.celdf.org. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. I want to thank Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Joan, uh, Dave King, and Janet Morris uh, for their volunteer time in getting us on the air. Thanks. And thanks to all of you for watching. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy, then I'll believe they're human like me.